Okay, well, I'll go ahead and get started. I think just about everybody's back. Uh, Jeff, I did some checking and uh, Hydra is actually the largest. Oh, hospital. yeah. Mm -hmm. Covers 3% of the uh, celestial sphere. And it, it just goes around mm -hmm. a large area. It doesn't seem that large. Pegasus certainly is impressive. I mean, it's, it seems very big. It, it's definitely big, especially because, you know, you see it overhead. Mm -hmm. But after Hydra, it's Virgo and then Ursa Major. Oh, wow. Cetus and Hercules. Hmm. Okay, so let's get into telescope designs and key elements of those designs. We'll talk about the terms and measurements of telescopes, the various types of telescopes, and then about a little bit about what you can see through your scope and how to go about learning to use your scope. So uh, this is the same slide we had last week. This is the Galilean uh, refracting telescope design. And all refractors are some variation of this. The big difference between one refractor and another is the complexity of the objective lens. but other than that, it's just a long tube with a lens on one end and an eyepiece on the other. And the focal length is the distance from the objective to the focal plane. And your eyepiece, one thing that I really like to do when the class is live and we can go outside afterwards is that you can take a, a piece of paper you can take a small piece of paper and preferably something that you can mostly see through. So like a piece of wax paper or something and then push your focuser all the way in. So it's as low as possible. Take the eyepiece out and then put the piece of paper o over the tube where the eyepiece goes and move it up and down and you will see the image formed on that piece of paper. So the way a telescope works is the image, it's all a telescope is, is, an, is a light amplification device. So it takes in a large amount of light and concentrates it onto a small space. And that simply brightens the image. And then you use an eyepiece, just like a magnifying glass to, just like you would look at a coin or a stamp or something like that with a, not, with a magnifying glass, but you're magnifying that image that's floating in space in the air on that focal plane. And that's all any telescope is, whether it's a lens type or a mirror type. So aperture is the diameter of the lens and I've got down here, aperture is the king of telescope measurements because that tells you how much light you're gathering. In fact, there are large uh, amateur reflecting telescopes are often called affectionately light buckets because they collect light. And of course, this is the Newtonian. It's got a reflect, it's got a mirror and the mirror surface is on the front, not on the back, like the mirror in your bathroom is reflective on the back. So you can't use just any mirror. And then there's compound telescopes or catadioptric telescopes, which combine both lenses and mirrors to form uh, an image in a typically more compact design. In fact, this is this is one right here. If you look at my video feed, I'm going to take the front of it off, front cap. And as I turn it around, you can see it's got a lens on the front, but it also has two mirrors. And one of the mirrors is glued to the, to the lens on the front. 
And this is actually very much like this diagram and the secondary mirror has somewhat of a telephoto effect. So even though this telescope is very short, the focal length on it is one and a quarter meters. So the focal length is 1250 millimeters, which is you know wider than I can really show you. So it's, it's longer than this one over here, which is about 900 millimeters focal length. Okay, so we've got refractors, we've got reflectors, we have catadioptrics. What, why should I pick one or another? What is good, what's bad? And I do want to preface this. I am not trying, <laughs> there, there is a good purpose for every telescope. So this, for example, is a little three inch Newtonian with a 900 millimeter focal length. This thing all together weighs about nine pounds. So it's highly portable and it's good at looking at planets. It's good at looking at uh, some bright nebula and star clusters. So I'll just kind of go through the advantages and disadvantages of different types and then help you understand why some machines are better for viewing some types of objects than others. Refractors tend to have the clearest, sharpest views. And that's mainly because the, uh, you see we've got a secondary mirror on, on the mirror types. And there's a lot of alignment issues that you get with mirror types. And I mentioned in the last session that refractors tend to have color aberration or what's called chromatic aberration. And that's only true of simple refractors of the type that existed for from the time Galileo started it until the 1800s roughly. Modern achromatic lens systems minimize that chromatic aberration. And another great thing about refractors is that they are factory aligned and you never need to realign them. In fact, if you attempt to realign some yourself, quite often the lenses, not only do they have to be aligned like this, but they have to be aligned axially as well. So, you should never really attempt to realign a refractor unless you contact the manufacturer to find out. And I have done that before. I've contacted the manufacturer to find out about cleaning a complex lens and uh, potentially realigning it and things like that. Now the disadvantages of refractors, the main disadvantage is the cost. Uh, because of the number of critical optical surfaces, a mirror has one optical surface. It's a mirror. You can't look through it. So there's only one surface to get right. But a lens has, a, has two optical surfaces and they have to be uh, constructed relative to each other perfectly. And not only that, but to have an achromatic lens, it's really a system of lenses. It's not just one piece of glass, it's multiple pieces of glass, often made of different materials. And so those things uh, to manufacture them is very expensive. And sometimes like if you were to get a Takahashi, say, which is a Japanese brand of telescope that uh, in particular, Takahashi refractors are extremely expensive, but all Takahashis are very high quality. And another disadvantage is that you're limited to about six inches of aperture unless you have extremely deep pockets. And if you recall from last week, the largest lens uh, ever constructed, I believe, was like Oh gosh, I can't remember. It was like the 
Paris uh, World's Fair or something like that. that but um, I, now I can't remember. I think it was like 60 or 70 inches, but it doesn't even, it's not in operation anymore. But the 40 inch Yerkes Observatory in um, Wisconsin, that, that is working. And that I believe is the largest one in the United States. So 40 inches, the largest one in the United States. So reflectors, so you can kind of think, of the advantages and disadvantages of the ref, reflect, refract, refractors, <laughs> kind of flip them over, and those are the, the disadvantages and advantages of reflectors. So the big advantage is that it's the lowest cost for any given aperture. And since aperture is king, reflectors dominate the world of amateur astronomy. I, you know, that used to be utterly true. I mean, that was extremely true in the 80s, 90s, even the early 2000s. But with modern astrophotography systems that are far more sensitive than your eye, refractors have made a huge comeback because of the clear, sharp views they produce. So reflectors eliminate chromatic aberration, so you don't have to worry about that. And that's why they are cheaper. They tend to be much lighter weight for any given aperture. Um, like, this, like I said, this three inch uh, reflector, the whole thing, including the mount, weighs nine pounds. Uh, a three inch refractor is gonna weigh, I don't know, somewhere between 12 and 20 pounds for the tube and then the mount that you get for it. So it's not a lot more, but it'll be more. And some designs like this mirror design are very compact for any given aperture. Now the disadvantages are, of course, the central obstruction blocks some of the light, but that it's typically, it's very small relative to the when you just do the math, uh, you typically block somewhere between five and 15% of the light. And then um, ref reflectors have what are called spider veins. I don't know if you can see this. Uh, not much. Uh, this reflector is kind of small, but the secondary mirror is held up by a spider. Now that's not true on this one because the secondary mirror is glued to the front of the telescope, uh, of the lens. I'm glued to the back of the lens on the front of the telescope. But all of the reflectors require alignment and you may be able to see all the little screws and knobs and things on the back here of this telescope to do that. You don't have to do that often, although I know some people who do it every time they go out, especially with catadioptrics. Now, let's talk about catadioptrics, the combination, which is what this guy is here. They are lower cost per for a given aperture than refractors, but usually more expensive than simpler Newtonians. And they have the same advantages of Newtonians, you know, no chromatic aberration and that kind of thing. But their compact physical size makes them much easier to move around. And in fact, when I travel, I, I will usually take this telescope here. And because of that, convenient lens on the front, you can glue the secondary to the front <laughs> lens and you don't have to have a spider. Spiders produce those diffraction spikes, those star-like spikes that come off of stars in photos. Some people actually like them in their photos. A lot of astrophotography you'll find is art. 
more than science. And that's great. It's, you're taking pictures of beautiful targets. They are a little easier to collimate than Newtonian catadioptrix. Not this one, actually, but others. Now, aperture, remember I said aperture is the single most important factor in choosing a telescope. You really want to go fairly large with your aperture. You know, you tend to, I would recommend, if you only had one scope, you're, you would want to go a little bit bigger than you might think you want to go. And I don't love this uh, comparison here because it kind of gives you the impression that the larger the mirror, the, the larger the magnification you get. And that's not true. The magnification comes from the eyepiece you use, really. What is true, though, is that the larger the aperture, the sharper the image will be, and the more that you can magnify it. So here with a five inch aperture, you see, I can't see the Cassini division, the split in the rings, but up here at eight inches, I can see it, but it's not real distinct. But here at 14 inch, I can really tell the outer bands from the inner bands and that Cassini division, this dark ring here is extremely prominent. And remember what I said before that the only purpose of a telescope is to gather a large amount of light and concentrate it to a small image. Magnification is the focal length of your main objective or mirror divided by the focal length of the eyepiece. So for example, if I, had a, if I have a 50 millimeter eyepiece, on a Celestron C8 that has a roughly 2,000 millimeter focal length, then I get about 41 power. And that's a typical, that's a typical kind of power that you would use. Um, yeah, so there's a question, is it normal for most New Newtonians to flip your view upside down? Absolutely. Uh, upside down, possibly backwards at, at the same time. And why do most experts tell us that you need to leave your scope out to adjust to the temperature? It's, it's uh, for two reasons. One is there are currents that get set up within the tube itself that can interfere with the quality of the image. And the other is that Things may be aligned, but they may uh, have different thermal properties and come to the same temperature at different rates. So one, the mirror glass takes longer to come to thermal equilibrium than metal. So yeah, it's, a, it's advisable to leave your telescope out for you know, 20, 30 minutes before before you do any kind of serious viewing, but I never let that slow me down. I set things up and start viewing right away. My, my viewing typically, uh, the image will typ typically get better um, as, the, as it reaches thermal equilibrium. So one of the key things here is that magnification is one of the least important attributes of your telescope. In fact, it's theoretically possible to push your telescope to nearly to virtually any magnification. Uh, but as a rule of thumb, so there's two types of optics. There's theoretical optics and there's physical optics. Theoretical optics says, oh, if I want a million power, all I need is a lens with a 0 0.0001 focal length. I'll go make one of those. But there are physical limits uh, to optics and you will never reach it. Of course, your, your view would be horrid. And as a rule of thumb, the maximum usable power is about 50 times the aperture 
of the telescope in inches. Powers how, higher than that give you dim, fuzzy, low contrast views. And you really have to remember what you're doing. Remember I told you about the technique of putting a piece of paper where your eyepiece goes. So that piece of paper will show the image floating in space. Now, it doesn't matter what eyepiece you use, you will never make that image brighter or bigger or anything. That image is what it is because that's the main mirror or the objective lens that's forming that. All you're doing with a shorter focal length eyepiece is looking at a smaller and smaller and smaller piece of that image that's formed. And so you can see that the smaller area of that image that you're looking at will be magnified higher because you're looking at it, you know, as at a smaller piece, but you're looking at less light. So it will be dimmer and dimmer and dimmer the higher the magnification goes. Higher powers are mainly used for lunar, planetary, and binary star observations. So these are all targets that have a rather high inherent brightness and, except for the moon, have very small inherent angular size. So binary stars, they look like pinpoints, but you, so you can magnify them quite a bit because their image is not spread over an area. Uh, similar with planets. And for the moon, you use high magnification because it is inherently very, very bright. And frankly, dimming down the moon is your problem. You may want a uh, lunar uh, polarized filter to observe the moon. So don't believe manufacturers who advertise a 300 or 750 power telescope, which is only 60 or 80 millimeters in aperture, uh, that is at, at the very least it's misleading. And you'll find out that no matter how large the aperture is, most of your observing is going to be done at relatively low powers, 20 to 50 power. With lower power, the images will be much brighter and crisper and provide more enjoyment and satisfaction with the wider field of view that you get. Okay, now on to telescope mounts. Another kind of rule of thumb, and I don't even have it here, is that the mount should cost about the same as the optics. In other words, um, spend, spend a good amount of money on the mount. And I, I did that with this telescope because <laughs> I spent about $20 on the, on the telescope itself and about 20 bucks on the mount. And this one um, has a mount made for it. And you can, I don't know if you can see much of it. I'll just kind of lift the tripod. It's much more substantial. Okay, I'll uh, go over. There are two general types of mounts and many, many subtypes within that. So the most common and least expensive are the Altaz mounts. And Dobsonian is the most popular type of that. And that's what this one is here. These mounts tend to be very stable, uh, rather low cost, and support rather large telescopes. So with this type of mount, you can spend more on the optics than the mount and get a very good stable mount. So stability, uh, stability and ease of moving around is really important. And this is a fork mount on this one. And then this is an equatorial mount, uh, a type that's called a German equatorial mount, but 
because it's got the counterweights. I guess it was designed initially in Germany, but I don't even know who designed it. Now I did want to show you or demonstrate with this telescope, it actually can be modified. So it work, it operates. I think we can all see this. Let me move it. So it operates as a uh, an Altaz. Now, the thing about an equatorial, I'll go into it in detail, is that this axis is aimed parallel to the Earth's axis, and that gives us some advantage when doing uh, when finding things. It aligns the telescope with the equatorial coordinate system. That's the main thing it does, but it makes it easier to track things and it makes it easier to do long exposure photography. In fact, I would say that it enables long exposure photography. So this mount here is an Altaz mount, but I can uh, flip this little thing and tilt it over and then it becomes an equatorial mount and it's got readings on this bar that I can set my latitude and I have to actually go quite far because we are pretty far south. And then this would be aimed at the North Star along this axis here. I'm going to put it back down. I rarely use it in the equatorial thing because I, I really don't need to unless I'm doing photography. Okay, so let's talk about advantages and disadvantages of Altaz. The main advantage is simplicity. It's just uh, the, the least expensive, simplest type of mount. And they tend to be very stable. Uh, in fact, this, uh, this kind of demonstrates it. When I convert this to an equatorial, it's less stable because it's kind of off balance a little bit. That, which is why I tend to use it in the Altaz. If I'm doing observation, uh, visual observations, I use Altaz. They're very easy to set up and they're really the best option for new observers, whatever the age. Now the disadvantages come when you're trying to track things. And even when you're visually observing, you have to move in both axes to track anything, to keep up with whatever you're looking at. And you can't really use it for long exposure photography, but a lot of modern photography, and I think um, session six, I believe, is on astrophotography. We'll go into it in detail. But a lot of modern photography is done with video where you're taking many, many, many uh, images and you can align those in software. So it's not so much of an issue as it used to be, but any long exposure, most video camera work is done for planetary and lunar photography. Okay, so why would you wanna use an equatorial mount? Well. One of the main reasons, as I mentioned, is alignment with the equatorial coordinate system. But the big advantage is that it requires only one act, motion in one axis to track targets. Because you're aligned with Earth's axis, all you need to do is move the telescope in the, in the opposite direction of the Earth. So the Earth is diving to the east, the earth moves around to the east, where you're standing, you're going to be east of where you are in an hour or in a minute. And so what you do is you rotate the telescope in the opposite direction to the west, and that keeps you tracking a specific star or any other celestial object. Now, 
um, field rotation is when you look in the eyepiece and whatever you're looking at starts rotating like this. And that occurs over a long period of time. And that's why it's not, uh, that's why the Altaz system is not good for long-term exposure. Now, obviously, the disadvantage is gonna be to, in the, in the area of cost. They tend to be higher cost because of their complexity and they're heavier if you especially have a German equatorial with counterweights. So this is just a extra mass you're carrying around for no good reason other than to balance the telescope. Fork mounts don't have counterweights, so they don't have that particular disadvantage. And then another thing, it takes longer to set up. You have to, in order to get the advantages of an equatorial mount, you have to align it with the Earth's axis. And you have to do that every time you go out unless it's a permanently mounted telescope. I don't have a permanently mounted telescope. Now, a lot of telescopes come with computerized mounts and there are two general forms that I wanna talk about. The first is called digital setting circles. And there are some brand names, but that's the generic name. And the second is called a go-to mount where you tell the computer, I wanna go look at Jupiter and it'll move the telescope. And that's what go-to means. So digital setting circles, uh, traditional setting circles, in fact, there are setting circles on this right here and up here. You can't really see them, but once you get your telescope aligned and you figure out what your local sidereal time is, then you align your setting circle with local sidereal time and you look in a a reference for the object you want, and then you move your telescope until the setting circles line up with the object that you looked up, its coordinates. And then lo and behold, you look in the eyepiece and there's your target. Well, the digital setting circles basically take the work of all the aligning and, and um, determining your sidereal time and all that stuff away from you. And all you have to do is point it at two stars, two known stars, and uh, the computer figures everything out. And so uh, digital setting circles, there, there's a, an encoder in each axis that tells the computer where the scope is pointed. And the way these work, uh, yeah, sometimes these are called push to systems. And I like that term really, because you're the motor. All you have to do is align on two stars. And I've got a push to system and I really love it. It's, um, it, it's so easy to use. I don't have to worry about <laughs> power. It doesn't have motors, so I don't have to plug it in. I can take it wherever I want to go. It runs off a nine volt battery, I think. The, the hand, in fact, it is this very, um, it's this, this is my um, push to telescope here. And you see the keypad, I can key in things. And once I set it up, it's amazingly accurate. I, I've been real pleased with it. Now go-to mounts have motors built in to the mount. And they also have the digital setting circles. So they combine the digital setting circles with motors to um, aim the telescope where you want it to go. And it requires aligning to two or three known stars during setup, depending on 
the type of accuracy you're looking for. Since it's pushing the scope around, it needs a little bit more accuracy, but uh, really not much more than I usually I have I also have a go to mount and I can put several different scopes on it. And um, I find that a two star mount is usually accurate enough, even for photography that I do. So it still requires polar alignment for equatorial mount. So um, you can't just set it anywhere you want and then point it at two stars. Now the push to that I have, it is an Altaz mount. So all I have to do, I can set it up. It doesn't matter where, what orientation, I just plop it on the ground and point it at two stars and I'm ready to go. The equatorial mount, the first step is aligning this axis and there is actually a small telescope through the center of this thing that you get down on the ground and look through to see Polaris to line it up with the North Star. So you've got to do that even though it's a computerized mount. And then once you do that, once you get it aligned, then you have to point it at two known stars. So it, these are both more expensive and they're harder to set up. And I have seen people who get these, you know, and if you're one of them, you don't have to raise your hand, <laughs> but I've seen people who've never used a telescope before. They buy a nice fancy telescope and you know, I, I can't say that's a bad thing to do because why waste your money on a lower cost telescope if you're only going to eventually buy a better one? Just go ahead and buy the good one. But then they start trying to use it at its maximum capability at the most automated way. And I've seen people spend two hours or more trying to set their scopes up, trying to get it aligned, trying to get a good reading on two stars or three stars, not really knowing exactly what the theory is behind it, just wanting to look at something. And meanwhile, others who have much lower cost telescopes have set their scopes up and looked at 12 objects. So the goal is to observe, not to run a computer. Uh, that, for that reason, I really don't recommend these for new observers, uh, and especially if you're on a budget. I mean, if you've got unlimited funds, I, I would say go ahead and get the, the scope that you think you would want in five or ten years if you're serious about it. So here's my recommendation. Everybody asks me, if, what, what do you recommend? I mean, I think we all get that. I know Jared gets that. Doug gets that. What do I recommend? Well, I recommend you get five telescopes because until you have five, you're not going to have everything you need because there is no one perfect telescope. But here's what I do rep recommend. I recommend an eight inch Newtonian on a Dobsonian mount. Now you can get that with or without uh, the digital setting circles because they don't add that much cost and they add they add a fair amount, but not a tremendous amount. It's a good compromise. Eight inches is a good compromise between large and small. Once you get a scope that's bigger than eight inches, it's hard to carry it around. Now, and you may even realize after you get a 12 inch telescope, I need a different car or vehicle to move this thing around in. So the telescope that you spent $2,500 on winds up causing you to spend $35,000 on a new vehicle to carry it. An eight inch, the cost will be far less than an equal sized refractor by, I mean, by far, you can't really get a good amateur eight inch refractor. So if you, if you do want to go the refractor route, 
I would recommend somewhere around the 100 to 120 millimeter diameter. It, that is roughly three and a half to five, three and a half to five inches or so. But those can be very expensive. Dobsonian mounts are very stable, inexpensive, super easy to set up. Um, it typically has two pieces, this tube here, and the mount is one piece. So there's not a lot to set up. Equatorial mounts often have um, the tripod, the mount, the head, then you've got counterweights you got to deal with, you've got the scope, the tube itself. So usually equatorial mounts have, yeah, you can leave some things set up together, but you're typically talking three to five or more parts to, to assemble when you arrive at your observing site. And an eight inch will perform for a lifetime. I mean, it, it would be something that is better than almost every observer of the um, 18th century. I mean, actually, it would be better than pretty much every observer of the 18th century because their manufacturing techniques were so bad. And the cost um, is around 400 for a basic simple Newtonian telescope on a Dobsonian mount, or about 650 for a push two. So it, the push two adds considerable cost, but um, much less than a, an equatorial mount would. I love this by Sir Patrick Moore. He, I don't know if you all know, he uh, ran the actually longest running television sh show in England called The Sky at Night, I believe is the name of the show. And um, he said, telescopes are either good or cheap, but not both. Okay, let's, uh, we'll take a quick look at accessories. How's my time? Oh, I'm gonna go a little bit over, but we won't spend too much time on this. Um, we'll take a quick look at eyepieces, finder scope, green laser. Well, actually, I'm going to get into planisphere, star charts, and other things later. But today, I'll I'll talk a little bit. But these are other types of accessories that you may want. Most eyepieces are made of multiple lenses, and <clears throat> they magnify the image. Here is a typical, typical eyepiece. This is, oh, actually, I want to show this one. This is my favorite eyepiece. It's a Teleview Nagler 13 millimeter. I find that the 13 millimeter eh, is great for all ki all types of of telescopes. I typically start out with a longer focal length. This is also a favorite. It's uh, It came with uh, a different telescope than this. It's a Mead brand, Super Plossil 26 millimeter, but the 26 millimeter Plossil by any manufacturer uh, around that focal length is a very good option, especially when you're, um, you know, when you first set up, remember, use a long focal length eyepiece. Here is a 55 millimeter, two inch diameter Plossil. Plossil is, let's see, this design here. It's actually, I, I know it's over a hundred years old. I don't remember when it was designed, um, but it's a, a German name. Um, I kind of highlighted the ones that I recommend. Uh, I have an Erfel that for many years when I was younger was my favorite. It's a 20 millimeter Erfel. 
it's also a fairly wide field of view with a very nice eye relief. That's one of the things about Urfel design is very nice eye relief, but all of these are very good designs. And there are other, uh, there are so many good designs out now that it's hard to keep up, but they tend to be expensive. This Teleview 13 millimeter. Okay, so <laughs> um, I mentioned that that Mead Super Plus 26 millimeter, it came with a telescope. I don't even remember which scope I got it with, but um, I believe you can buy them for around 50 bucks. The Teleview 13 millimeter Nagler, it cost me over $200 and that was, that was well over 20 years ago. I don't even know what they cost now. I find when I'm observing that I like to have two, maybe three eyepieces with me. And I usually start out with like the 26 millimeter. So I have a 25 to 40 millimeter for low power. Um, I use this large one on a very long focal length telescope that I have. So at 55 millimeters, I get, uh, I get a fairly low power. And then have a 12 to 15 mil millimeter, that's this, like this 13. And finally, a five to nine. Now here's a five millimeter Nagler. Um, also a rather expensive thing. Um, you can get plossels in all of these and they are, uh, I love plossels. They're a great compromise between wide field of view and good eye relief and relatively low cost. Okay. Uh, I will say a little bit about a Barlow lens. So a Barlow lens, you'll usually get one with any telescope you buy. Honestly, I don't know why they do it other than they're being cheap because a Barlow lens multiplies the power of any other lens, but it adds an additional optical element and it reduces your field of view. So to me, it's just not worth I have a couple of Barlows and you know where they sit. They sit, they occupy space in my eyepiece box and they are buddies. The two of them are buddies and they never talk to anybody else. Uh, because if I want a, uh, if I want to multiply the power of my eyepiece, I just get a, a, low, a smaller focal length eyepiece. So, Barlow's are okay if that's all you have, uh, but they, the, the fact that they reduce your field of view really to me is one bad thing, but any optical element, whether it's a filter, an eyepiece, what, whatever that is, any optical element you introduce is going to reduce the amount of light or it's gonna scatter light. And everything you want, you want to minimize that in general. So that's something I always keep in mind. But uh, Barlow's do have purpose every now and then. Uh, like if you have a camera, it's uh, a way to uh, increase the effective focal length of your system or increase the magnification of your camera because cameras. Aren't, aren't like visual, they are what they are. They're one size with one telescope, but we'll get into that later. So with a camera, Barlow could be yeah. quite useful. You forgot double stars, Jeff. Yeah, Barlow's uh, are good for double stars. That's, that's a good point uh, mm -hmm. because double stars, uh, they are the same brightness regardless of magnification. Okay, every eyepiece is rated with an apparent field of view and they typically will show them on the, on the uh, eyepiece. And now I'm looking, I'm picking this up and not seeing it. 
Some of them do, some of them don't. But it's expressed as an angle. Most plossils have an apparent field of view of 50 degrees. So if you go higher than that, like Nagler's, I believe are around 70 degrees, they tend to cost more for a higher apparent field of view. Uh, but they do pay off. Your true field of view is the apparent field of view divided by the magnification. If your scope is 1200 millimeter and you're using a 25 millimeter plossal with an apparent field of view of 50 degrees, then your magnification is 48 and your true field of view is about one degree. So that's pretty good. If you use a 10 millimeter eyepiece with 50 degree apparent field of view, you're only getting a uh, 25 minutes, which is a little less than a half a degree, 0.42 degree. So keep in mind, higher magnification equals smaller field of view. Higher apparent field of view equals wider true field of view. And finder scopes. So even at low power, your telescope's field of view is about one degree. We just, we just saw that in this, which is a fairly typical kind of thing. But the area of the sky is um, 41, <laughs> over 41,000 square degrees and one degree in diameter is an area of less than one square degree. So you, you could only see a 50,000th of the sky looking through your telescope. So you're, it's, it's like looking through a drinking straw and not being able to see anything else other than what's in the drinking, what's through the drinking straw. So you need something to help you see a larger neighborhood. And there are three general types, the finder telescope, the heads up display system, or, or you can use a laser pointer. I, recently used a laser pointer as a finder. Now these are typical finder scopes and they will usually see about four to five degrees of sky, which is much larger than the area of the sky that your main telescope can see. So the images produced are likely to be upside down, backwards, both, and often they don't produce the same image that you see through your telescope. <laughs> so that's kind of a problem. Some like this one here has a lighted crosshair, a reticle to aid in centering the target in the finder. And that's, those are really nice. I, I like those. And nearly all telescopes come equipped with some, some have a prism called an erecting prism that corrects this upside down and backwards kind of view. Now, reflex finders, I mentioned this last week. Uh, Telrad is the original and in my opinion, still the preferred. It, it's a system, it's like a heads up display system if you've ever seen one of those in a car or if you're lucky enough to fly jets. It projects a dot or a series of rings onto the sky to form a 1x, one magnification, that is no magnification. On a Telrad, it has three rings. You can't really see them here, but the inner ring is a half degree, then the middle ring is two and the outer ring is four. And some text, uh, some books with maps actually have Telrad circles on them. That's a four degree circle and that's a half degree circle. Okay, some reflex sites have a single red dot and I've, I brought one here to show. This is a red dot finder. This is actually a reflex finder on this telescope, but it has uh, two rings, not three, like a Telrad, 
but it is similar in that it has rings. Now, red dot is okay, but what does it do? It, it projects a single dot and the dot covers the very target you're trying to point the scope at. That's why the rings are better is <laughs> because you put the target inside the ring, you see. And a lot of times scopes come with a red dot. That's, a, that's how I have this. Um, and what do I do? I take it, take it off and put it away to use as a demonstration and then get one of these with a circle. I love reflex finders. I, I like them. I can hardly use a regular finder scope anymore. I use them uh, on all my scopes now. Uh, this Jeff? Is, yeah, this is called a Rigel brand. Yes, Doug? Um, some red dots have cir circles or a circle in the middle as recticles. They give you different recticles. Okay. And you don't have to have a dot on your target. They they have something with a circle that, but they're still not as good as a Telerad. Yeah, uh, but any, I mean, I I wouldn't even call that a red dot. I would call that a red circle. But mm -hmm. the big disadvantage of all reflex finders is that they don't magnify. So if you're not real familiar with the sky you will not, you know, the, the thing about using uh, the reflex finders is if you're hunting for a faint galaxy or nebula and there are no guide stars, if there are no stars like these stars nearby, it can be more difficult than with a fi regular finder scope that does magnify. But I, I find that I can use them to find things quite easily. Now, some people use laser pointers as finders, and I've done that. I, I did that quite recently because I've left my tail rat at home, and all I had was my laser. Um, in fact, I, I have, I have one here, and I use this to turn it on. I don't want to shine it in the camera, but you can see the laser. Um, but the the real nice thing about laser pointers mounted on your scope is to show others where the scope is pointed. So you can use them to show when people say, well, what are you looking at? <laughs> well, here's what I'm looking at. Okay, I'm, I'm close to the end. Uh, some suggestions. I, I just want to warn you, some things are hard and take a bit of time to master. However, I, I think the rewards are really worth the effort. One of the most important things is to dress appropriate for long-term comfort and join a community. Uh, become a member of VBAS or hook up with other observers to share your views and uh, share your experience with, with them, find out what they know, teach them what you know, and have fun. Uh, you're gonna wanna continue the effort if you relax and enjoy it. If you get stuck finding things or setting up your scope, uh, it can be very frustrating. And there are a lot of good telescopes on the used market uh, around February and March after people get these things in Christmas and then can't figure out how to use them. One thing I warn people is never underestimate the power of the cold. Now, my recommendation is to dress for 10 to 20 degrees colder than it actually is. 45 degrees may not sound too cold, but usually we experience 45 degree weather for only a few seconds or minutes at the most. I mean, you go to the grocery store, oh, it's 45 degrees out, I'll take a jacket. Or you go to work in the morning, uh, you go to get the mail, but you don't stand out in the cold 
in 45 degrees and 45 degrees without the proper clothes will just it'll just kill you <laughs> so double socks bring gloves uh, i have some glove liners that i really like uh, because i can keep them on even when i'm manipulating the telescope thermal underwear hat is always good boots layers layers camping and hunting stores good sources for these kind of supplies uh, lose your ego you may have the nicest telescope out in the field but if you can't find anything it's not worth it it's not worth a darn so the most important thing is that you be able to set up your scope find the things you want to find and have fun in the process of doing it If all, you know, if all you want to look to, the, in fact, I've had people tell me, you know, why do you spend all that time outside when you can go online and see pictures from the Hubble? Well, if that's what you're after, I'd say go do that. But it's a far more uh, enjoyable experience to actually be out under the stars, to find things yourself and to experience a, a view that you know is live. This is now, this is what's coming. Th these are photons that have traveled in some cases, millions or billions of years to get to you. Uh, one of the things I do recommend is um, if I can find it in binoculars, I can find it in my telescope. If you can learn to use your binoculars as a telescope, it really, uh, actually, I use binoculars more as a finder scope than I do uh, any finder scope. In fact, I don't even have finder scope on any telescope anymore. All I have are reflex sights. And I, what I do is find the object in my binoculars and I look for the stars nearby and the the relative distance is, oh, this is, uh, forms a triangle with these two stars. And then I use the reflex sight to position, even though I can't see what I'm looking for, I know it's there because I found it in my binoculars. Uh, this is just more of the same. Jeff, did you hear about what Dallas is doing? Dallas. Dallas, Texas. No, what's that? They're turning off all their lights to um, reduce the number of b birds that pass through. And turning off your lights is a double gift yeah. for astronomers. So we need, we need to coerce the Turning the lights off to reduce the birds from coming in, I guess? Yeah, because they're attracted to the light We're, put together. You get done. Yeah, they run into buildings when the lights are on. It also makes the sky start for amateur astronomers. Okay, I've got several targets for this week. Um, the planets, Jupiter and Saturn, are still in great position. Don't miss out. They're going to be around for another month or so. I've got some times that the great red spot uh, transits, which means it's right in the middle of the planet. Um, but I recommend trying to hit the Ring Nebula, Albireo, a double star, and then M15 is the challenge object for this week, and constellations to identify are Cygnus and Pegasus. Let me go on now to show you. This is the Ring Nebula, and this is actually uh, the type of view you can see you through a telescope. So you'll see a field of view about like that with the ring about that size. Tiny, tiny. Mm -hmm. But sure it looks just like that. Just like that? Mm -hmm. yeah. Without the color though. Correct. Oh. Okay, without the color. <laughs> so here's, I don't know. here's a different uh, look at it. A um, good way to find the ring is you find these two stars in Lyra and set your scope about halfway between them and 
usually the ring pops in right around the halfway point. That's correct. It, it is actually one of the easier targets to find because this is Vega, the brightest star out right now overhead, the brightest star overhead. And this is Lyra. And we talked about it a little bit last week. And this is the second brightest star in Lyra. Um, and this is south, you know. Why is eyes in two different colors? Uh, two pictures. Okay, actually, uh, actually, I think I have a, uh, uh, well, this is a color image here, and then this is a black and white image, but. Um, this is the, one of our first SPIG images, I think. So the red, uh, I just recently learned is nitrogen. I always thought the red was hydrogen, but the red is nitrogen. The blue, I believe, is oxygen, right? Mm -hmm. And um, then there is there is a hydrogen. There's actually a very a fairly large but extremely faint. You cannot see it visually. Um, globe of glowing hydrogen out much larger. And you have to have, you know, much bigger telescope to detect that hydrogen because it's very, very faint. Well, yeah, what is that? Nebula. This is, is the same. No, this, this is the ring nebula. Oh, it is? Yeah. Um, yeah. And if, if you so have this, a source telescope. A space telescope. Is, did I say source? The so here, iconic ring take nebula a look at this lies little... in the summer constellation Lyra. This glowing ring of gas is the result of the death of a sun-like star. As the star runs out of fuel, intense radiation from its core heats the outer layers and they escape into space. The nebula turns out to have a much more complex shape Oops. than we can see from Earth. The main structure of the nebula is a broad ring of nitrogen. That's the red ring you see. Hotter oxygen gas is seen here in green and fills the interior. What's even hotter still is helium, and it's seen here as blue oblong lobes perpendicular to the nebula's main structure. A num number of dense, dark knots of gas circle the inside of the red nitrogen ring and have so far resisted the blast of stellar winds and radiation. The shadows of these knots can be seen as long, thin spikes around the ring. Glowing hydrogen also reveals the inner and outer halo lobes, which formed when the star began to burn out. This detailed three-dimensional model of the ring nebula will help astronomers understand the last stages of a star's life. Our sun is expected to have a similar fate in about 5 billion years. That's 5 billion with a B. We're <laughs> about halfway through the sun's lifespan. Lucky us. We're, we're lucky the sun has such a long life because- That's correct. Massive stars, they blow up rather quickly compared to our star. Okay, um, yeah, here is Cygnus the Swan, and it is, you can see, this is the Altas coordinate system, so that's my zenith, and it is right overhead. Uh, that's Deneb and Vega, two corners of the Summer Triangle. There's M57, and here is Alberio. Alberio is this beautiful gold and blue double star. And that is what it looks like visually. Actually, the gold looks almost um, brighter yellow. It, it, it's not white, it's visibly yellow. And the blue is, is visibly blue. The gold is also a double, a binary, spectroscopic binary, I think. Yeah, and like Doug mentioned earlier, you can put a lot of magnification on this, although it doesn't need a lot to split it into the two blue and gold. And then Pegasus is one of the 
uh, you, you know, you'll see this great square kind of in the southeast. And if you follow, I believe this is actually the horse's head, but I'm not completely sure. But if you yeah, follow this- That's his head and neck, yeah. Yeah. If you follow this out to here, you know, follow this arm and you can see these stars fairly well. This one's a little fainter, I think. Well, uh, but you can see this arm going out and then jump right across to M15. Now M15 is too faint for you to see visually. You'll need binoculars or the finder scope. But because it's, you know, pointed along this line, it's fairly easy to find and it is uh, not quite as beautiful as M13, the Hercules cluster, but it is uh, similar, uh, a beautiful Okay, 